uh, some work from my lab, and I'm going to make it uh, a talk which gives you a primer as well as shows some applications of translational genomics in uh, multiple myeloma. So, uh, next generation sequencing was a term coined almost 30 years after Watson and Crick elucidated the model of DNA. And interestingly, it was uh, coined because the small group of people coming together after a conference wanted to find a name for a journal. And after about three pitchers of beer, they decided on the term genomics to encompass all the single gene discoveries that had been made um, around uh, the mid-1970s and mid-1980s, and it stuck as the massively parallel sequencing or next generation sequencing technologies took off uh, very soon in the early 90s and early 2000, uh, RNA-seq became predominant. The Human Genome Project was completed, and now we have many applications of this uh, being used in patients in both solid and hematological diseases. So what is next generation sequencing exactly? To put it simply, we take the genome from a patient's tumor cell and fragment it into little bits. These little bits are then ligated with custom adapters and put into a machine that looks like this. This is an Illumina sequencer. In this machine, these little bits are read out one base pair at a time, and then a computer puts together or reassembles the genome at the end. So this couldn't have happened until the computational revolution took place because it needs a fair amount of computer power to do the reassembly and alignment. There are different flavors of this that are used both in research and in uh, our practice. Whole genome sequencing gives us information about all the coding regions as well as the non-coding regions in the genome and tells us not just about mutations and copy number alterations, but also about large structural variations that can be missed if we just do whole exome sequencing. Sorry. Uh, having some trouble with slides, but whole exome sequencing, on the other hand, tells you about all the coding regions in the genome. This is about 2% of the genome and uh, is very useful for looking at point mutations and copy number alterations. The most common form of sequencing that is used commercially is the PCR amplicon technique where we focus on hot spots where mutations are known to occur and ignore the rest of the genome. Another flavor of NGS is not to use the DNA, but the message that's coming out of it by RNA sequencing. And again here, we can look at all the RNA that's coming out, or just a few regions of interest. So to summarize, DNA sequencing is useful for point mutations and copy number alterations, whereas RNA-seq is useful for gene expression and microRNA expression. At Sinai, we've taken a more systematic approach, and we don't use just regions of the genome to study. We actually study the entire uh, patient's coding region using whole exome sequencing and uh, RNA sequencing. And we've developed a software called Daphne to analyze this data along with our computational colleagues uh, in Joel Dudley's group. I'm go going to give you an example uh, about how we use this in the clinic with one of my own patients who's a 70-year-old artist. Um, he's a painter who developed IgG lambda myeloma around uh, October 2014. And as you can see in this timeline, 
He was treated with standard therapies and had multiple lines of treatment, ultimately uh, relapsed after each one. And around Jan 18, the patient was planning to go to hospice because he had developed cirrhosis and transaminitis, could not qualify for CAR-T trials or other novel agents. And we decided to perform next generation sequencing as he was progressing on even uh, venetoclax. The sequencing results um, come back to us in this form, and we were able to actually identify uh, mutations, copy number alterations, and RNA expression changes that suggested sensitivity to uh, trametinib, CDK4-6 inhibition, and proteasome inhibition. We therefore added these drugs onto his treatment plan, and Interestingly, his tumor burden dropped dramatically, continues to drop to date. This is now more than 10 months since we started. The patient is still alive, continues to paint and come to clinic every week, um, which is quite amazing and gratifying. So like this, we've treated a number of patients using the Daphne pipeline approach, and we published the results earlier this year. Uh, in this is the waterfall plot of the response from the patients treated on the study. In orange are the patients treated with RNA-based uh, methodology. In blue are the patients treated based on DNA changes. And in green are the patients treated on the basis of DNA and RNA-based changes. You can see a predominantly majority of the patients that had a response benefited from changes that were observed looking at RNA. This is surprising because most of the commercial sequencing technologies use only targeted DNA sequencing. So we are missing a big portion if we don't look at RNA. We are now taking this to the next level where instead of sequencing bulk cells, we are sequencing individual cells and over here, each dot is one individual myeloma cells from a relapse, relapsed refractory patient. The different colors represent cells that are transcriptionally similar to each other, forming a transcriptional clone, if I can call it that. And we can then do pathway analysis and interrogate the different pathways that are activated in different transcriptionally similar clones to come up with a clone-specific recommendation for treating these patients. Another exciting development that's come about is peripheral blood, or cell-free DNA sequencing. This was a publication earlier this year by Jans Lohr and colleagues at Dana-Farber, which made two interesting points. The first point was that there was good concordance between the bone marrow findings and peripheral blood findings in terms of the different mutations identified. And even more interestingly, the mutation burden corresponded to the disease burden. So this could be a new way, a non-invasive way of tracking disease burden, which could come about in the future. So stay tuned. The third application, which I'm going to end with, is the use of sequencing data to inform us about immunotherapy. And the way we do this is we, we look at what new antigens are being produced when a tumor cell is developing. So new antigens are mutations that ultimately get presented by the tumor's own major histocompatibility complex to the immune cells. And these can be uh, then used to trigger T cell responses and ultimately cause cell death. Uh, when we apply our new antigen identification pipeline to the whole exome and RNA sequencing data, we get results that look like this. So we get the patient's HLA type, and then we get the particular mutation and the peptide sequence corresponding to that mutation change that can be immunogenic to the patient's own T cells. So how do we use this? I'm going to tell you about a patient who was referred to us from Connecticut. This is a 65-year-old teacher 
who came to us with primary refractory disease. She was treated with frontline therapy and kept relapsing. And ultimately, we decided to do something radical to get her disease under control. Based on some mouse modeling work that had been done with my colleague, uh, Josh Brody, we decided to give the patient an immunotransplant. So what is this? In an immunotransplant, we use a dual checkpoint inhibitor therapy. As you all know, checkpoint inhibitors were awarded the Nobel Prize earlier this year. Uh, we follow that up with a reduced intensity uh, transplant using MEL100 and BCNU100. And then go on further with double checkpoint inhibitor therapy and ultimately taper off. You can see this refractory patient went into remission. Indeed, MRD showed that it was a stringent, complete remission. And she stayed that way for 15 months. When we looked at her T-cell clones before and after the checkpoint inhibitor therapy, there was an expansion of T-cell clones. And it turned out from her sequencing data that she had about 40 mutated neoantigens that could be potentially immunogenic. We systematically synthesized these neoantigen peptides and then interrogated the patient's own T cells before and after this immunotransplant maneuver. And we boiled down from those 40 that the T cell response was actually very specific to a single neoantigen, which was in a mutation called, of a gene called PRKDC. And this led to a 100 to 200 fold T cell activation following checkpoint inhibitor treatment, which was associated with clinical response. Like this, we've treated several patients, and we have a manuscript that's uh, in review. But another practical application of the neoantigen pipeline is actually to develop cocktails of these immunogenic peptides that can be given back to the patient as a vaccine. So this is a personalized cancer vaccine for each individual patient. And we have a clinical protocol with Nina Bhardwaj with patients enrolling. Actually, Ruben's patient was one of the first myeloma patients on this uh, protocol. Uh, in summary, I'd like to show, uh, I'd like to say that DNA and RNA-based drug repurposing is feasible and useful in relapsed myeloma. We have a trial of uh, 1,000 patients that's going to start at Mount Sinai very soon. Uh, clinical trials that target new antigens using personalized cancer-specific vaccines are now possible. And we have a, a trial open with uh, Nina Bhardwaj, who's a world-famous vaccine expert. If you all have patients that are interested, we are happy to screen them. Uh, clearly, improvements are still needed. We need faster turnaround times and clone-specific predictions to be made uh, bioinformatically. We also need to incorporate more drugs that are emerging that target the microenvironment. With that, I'd like to say that we are developing a translational program at Mount Sinai that uses a variety of platforms that look at both the tumor and the microenvironment to develop biomarkers and new drugs for our patients that will ultimately benefit them and feed back into our research. And it's only possible because of the excellent colleagues um, in, in the clinical uh, team, in the lab, uh, our collaborators um, in different labs at, inside and outside the institution, and most importantly, the patients that are contributing to the research, not just with philanthropy, but also their own samples. Thank you very much. And I'll take questions uh, at the end.